in our families, we're all going to get together and tell stories, and that's a big part of kind of our culture. And so it just felt like a, I just I couldn't believe that that was a possibility to do for a living. And uh, so I trained in classical theatre, and that's where it all began. And classical theatre. Um, oh, I'm sorry, classical theatre. Um, from there, I believe some of the earliest work you did was actually for radio, though, right? Did you do that to yeah, but that was like uh, an hour of my oh, okay. <laughs> one hour. Um, I joined the Royal Shakespeare Company, um, the Royal National Theatre. And I did um, Jacobean plays, and um, I did new plays, and, um, and all sorts of, kind of range of things. And nominated for an Olivier Award for two, Olivier. two. Thank forgive you. me. <laughs> so that was something special, you know, getting at the beginning of your career to be recognised so quickly. Um, I, well, it's kind of been over time. I've been working now for about eleven years. And uh, it's, it still feels like an apprenticeship. Every job is different, and every every kind of character requires something different of you. And uh, it always feels good to kind of every time I start a job, I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I forget how to act. Don't want, I have no idea who I am and what any of it means. And that's a really exciting place to start because that's when you open yourself up to creativity. And additionally, you also did some television work because you did build the adaptation of the novel Pillars of the Earth, and you were uh, nominated for a Golden Globe for that. Uh, what was that? How was the transition to film work? Uh, um, well, it was it was weird. I when I was twenty three, I got discovered by Woody Allen, and it was um, eight months out of drama school, and I was kind of launched into that film world, and it was kind of learning it as a sort of rabbit in headlights. Really, I was kind of didn't know what 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 it was all about, and what marks were, and how you say. You know, I'd spent three years in, in drama school where you work for six weeks rehearsing a play and you get it on its feet and you figure out how to tell a story from the beginning middle to the end. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to film, you have to kind of, there's lots of people standing around with equipment and it's very stop-start. It's like if it was a sport, it would be American football. It's very stop-start, <laughs> very intense in that period of action. And it, that's a, it was a whole different experience really. And it took me a while to figure out the technical side of it. And it's, it's got to be a challenge also because in film it's uh, shot out of sequence. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you, you have to remember where my character is, right? Yeah, it's a different kind of preparation that's required of you. Every time you, you start the day, you have to, and you see, you know, you, you're shooting five or six scenes that day, and one might be the, you know, three quarters of the way through the movie, and one might be, and then followed by the first scene of, of the film. So it's, it's really important to kind of to familiarize myself with where I'm at in the story and what my character at any given point knows and does not know. Um, and that's, it's kind of like a, a jigsaw puzzle. Okay. Uh, one of the other things you, you uh, did for television was also uh, the remake of The Prisoner. Were you aware of its cult status when you took that role? Yes, and I probably wouldn't have done it <laughs> if, I, uh, if I'd sort of put more attention. It was a very, very bizarre project. I didn't really understand it. <laughs> And then, uh, obviously, Marvel came calling, mm -hmm. you auditioned for Peggy Carter, I mean, how'd that all come about? Um, I, was, I was in London, and um, I, I had spoken to my agent about I'd like to kind of get out of the corset. I'd done the Duchess with Kira Knightley and Brighton revisited with Emma Thompson and Michael Gambon, and I'd love that, I'd done Mansfield Park, and, and all these period dramas, and um, I started to see a pattern emerging, but that was all the kind of thing that I was doing, and I wanted to explore different genres, really. And, um, and so I, was, uh, I went to meet the casting director in LA just as a general meeting and said, you know, I'd be up for doing an action film, for example. And she was like, well, funny you should mention that because I'm, I'm working on something at the moment. And I hadn't heard of Captain America. I wasn't familiar with comic books. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, and I went back to London and I sent in a tape. And then I was take kind of run run of them like through the mill of, of audition processes and then the final audition was I think it was down to myself and one other person and we had about a ten hour audition where you do you, you're put into full hair makeup and, and costume and then you're I was given eight pages of dialogue to learn and then also a twenty minutes to learn a fight sequence and then uh, about half an hour to learn how to load and unload guns and this was all with a crew of, uh, of, uh, at a studio in Shepperton Studios in England where we filmed, we ended up filming the film. And at the same time, um, you have the director and the assistant directors and everyone's kind of watching you do it and it's, it's absolutely terrifying. And the, the main thing is of auditions is trying to just hold your nerve so you can get the work done because nerves can sometimes get the better of you. And in my, my, I know some people when they get nervous they tend to talk a lot, I disengage and I become really paralysed. So I was just fighting all the way through that audition, going just, just be, just engage, just take a breath, just be here, be present, and kind of disappear into your own world. 
Um, and uh, and then remarkably, you know, I did, did my best job, and, and that's the thing I kind of learned of going to some auditions and not getting part of learning how to do the best work in and of itself, so the audition of itself is a good experience, and that I come away with my dignity intact, feeling that like I prepared and I done what I could, and then you really let it go. If it's not yours, it, if it's not your train, then you let it pass, and. Captain America ends up being the train that stopped at my station, and so I, I got on for the ride, and it was wonderful. Now, I know Chris Evans, when he was signed, signed for a nine-picture deal, so he could be in multiple Marvel movies. Did they have the same plan for Peggy? No, not at all. This was just, you know, she was the, the female bit, uh, kind of you know, the sidekick. Um, and, and that was it, and I, I loved her immediately. Um, and I, I remember at one point that scene um, at the end where she's on the phone to him as he's crashing, that was my audition oh, wow. scene, and I remember the day of it, um, Chris was, God love me, he was in his own clothes behind the set reading his lines, because obviously he'd filmed his, his coverage of it days before. So he was kind of behind me, kind of giving up my lines, but it was, it was such a, a weird way to do such an emotional scene, you know, um, to not have Chris on the phone, to be on my own in the studio, um, and, and I couldn't quite engage with it emotionally, and then, Joe Johnson, the director, took me out to his train and said, I want, you to, I want you to see what you did in that audition that got you this part. And I want you to do that again in this scene. And so I watched it and, uh, and then I was able to kind of figure out a little bit more of what he wanted. Okay, at what point did you engage with the comics? Did you read up on, on what Stanley and Jack Kirby did with Peggy Carter? I, I mean, I spent some time with, with Stan. He's a very generous guy and he has a kind of a natural curiosity and inquisitiveness that keeps him pa very passionate about what he does. And he's a remarkable man. Um, and I've learned more from coming to conventions, really, and having recommendations from people and seeing how committed um, fans of the genre are and right. how, how wonderful that is. And were you surprised when they called you back and said we want you again? Yeah, I was because you, you, it's it's the biggest compliment it, it, as an actor is to be re-employed. I mean that that makes <laughs> you kind of go, oh oh, it, you liked me enough to want to see me again because all this, oh you're amazing, I love you, and then they, you never hear from them again. You're like, well, uh, that means nothing to me. <laughs> so for me, when I get if if I get compliments, I t I graciously accept them, but I take them with a pinch of salt because you know that. As just being polite and whatever, get it going throughout your day. Um, but to get a call saying we want Peggy back was was a, a great kind of validation of the the work we'd all done to put her together. And so when Luis Esposito called and said, we're, I said, what do you think about a show? Um, and I was just I was delighted. As it was, it's what's lovely is being being reemployed, but also it means you get to go back to work with the people that you'd had such a great experience with in the first place. Well, the, the Marvel one shot you, you did, um, you know, that was released in DVD that set up the concept of Peggy, uh, you know, that must have been different because you're quick, you're in, you're out, you, you shoot that 10 minute thing real fast. Did you imagine that there could be more to be done? I, I wasn't, I, the one thing that I learned in this industry, uh, which has served me well, is not to have expectations and not to try and um, let your ego or your kind of d ambition overtake the reality of the situation that you find yourself in. And again, with the short, I loved doing it, um, but I didn't want to set myself up for disappointment because so many factors go into the making of the show, sure. no matter how hard one person works, it's got to be a collaboration. Um, so I was just, I was pleasantly surprised that it, it kind of got a life it deserved. Before we talk about the show, um, I, I found that when you were shooting First Avenger, you were also studying art history and haiku. Yeah. What, 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 <laughs> what prompted all that? I was, I'm restless. I'm a really See restless that? person, and I get, which means I get bored easily. So on, on a film set, as amazing as it, every, it, it is, for me, there was a lot of hanging around on the set and I'd be sat in my trailer and there's only so much uh, computer games I can do without kind of feeling my brain turning to mush and I'm not spoken to any humans in a while. <laughs> so um, I, I just did this uh, three month course with the Open University which is a fantastic online university in the UK and uh, it was uh, art history, um, the history, history of uh, democracy or the fight for democracy in Burma and haiku poetry. I was great, it was great. Chris was like looking at me like I was crazy and really dull and nerdy, but it entertained me. That's great, do you still write haiku now? 
No, I have no idea. Still, I have no idea what it's about. I appreciate it. Respect <laughs> 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 So, they go off to the ABC series, and you come over to the United States and start working. Um, how is American television different than British television? It, the speed. The speed at which it, it works. And, you know, I, I mean, my first day of filming, I didn't sleep the night before, and I was up at five to, to start work, and I didn't get back to like eight or nine in the evening. And that became my reality for the first, you know, for the, those four months. And, um, I find that quite exciting because, again, I come from a place where you're, you get given the text, which is the Bible of the piece, and you study and you prepare and you work it and you make choices and you try things and they don't work and you try something else, but with TV, this is a script, it will change on the day, and it will change sometimes while you're working. The writer will come in and go, but change it to this line, or actually we're going to rewrite that whole speech. So you have to be on your toes, and I find that quite exciting because it stops you from overthinking things and you just have to launch yourself into it. So I, I found it very liberating. For the, for the recurring characters on the uh, miniseries, did they come to you and go, what's this Marvel Universe about? You know, did they want to understand that would all fit? Yeah, I think, I mean, J James Darcy, who plays Jarvis, was probably the one who was like, what are we doing, what are we doing? Because we, we'd, uh, we'd done Mansfield Park together like, eight years previously, and he was in that. And I, I knew him from just kind of the acting scene in London. And, uh, and I'd actually, I actually bumped into him at the theatre like a year before the show actually started filming, and he said, what are you up to? I said, well, Marvin are trying to get this show made. And he was like, oh, that sounds fantastic. Good for you. And then he left. And then, you know, a year later he calls me and he's like, um, I'm playing Jarvis. <laughs> so that was great. And it just meant that we were able to kind of create that, those characters together, have them based on a friendship. And I think it shows because the two of you on screen had this great vibe back and forth. And it's very respectful. And obviously he still loves his wife, so that no one expects him, you know, to get together romantically. Uh, were you able to add elements, or was it just what was on the script? Yeah, I think the first the first season was very much um, the writers trying to gauge how all the characters would interact with each other, and then when they saw us interacting in between takes, by the time we got to the second season, they were very much writing to suit us and have our natural rapport with each other. James often would come out with alternative lines, which were very funny, and some made it, I can't, some made it, some didn't. Um, but you, you'd kind of throw things out there, or I would say that word sounds a bit too American, I think it, it, she, she would more likely say it this way. And they were, um, they were very accommodating to that. But at the same time, James and I couldn't believe how well these writers wrote for English characters. Because the sense of humour is different. Of the, course. The rhythm of a line and the inflection of a line is completely different. And um, they were brilliant. Their witticisms and their references were spot on, so we were delighted. It was also a challenge because it was period. You were, you know, you were a, an immigrant in America. You were a woman. And you know, so much of the first season is about being taken seriously. Uh, you know, how did that feel considering you're a 21st century woman? Well, I kind of, I think it's, I think there, there are elements to that which still exist. I mean, if I think about myself as a young girl uh, coming from a working class background in London, um, trying to develop myself as, a, as an actor that had a craft that wasn't just a pretty face with a brand to sell, that actually had a story they wanted to say, and it took a while to know how to take myself seriously. With obviously with a healthy amount of, of humility and a sense of humor about it, but that that was you know that was kind of a struggle, um, and uh, it still continues to be. And you, I think that it's you know we define ourselves, we teach people how to treat us based on how we react to them. Um, so I you know I spent my first few years in coming out of drama school, making my way in, in this career of of trying not to get to pulled in it this direction or that direction to do too many pieces of work that I found would kind of not be a great way to contribute to the world. Okay. Um, and I think I think Peggy feels the same way. She's having to navigate herself through an incredibly sexist environment of the 1940s where you know being slapped on the butt by your by your male colleague was kind of you know, a given in the office. Um, and or just to be ignored or to be undermined or to be ridiculed or humiliated. Um, 
because of the belief that women were there to be secretaries, which if they wanted to do that, fantastic. But those who had a little bit more to do and say were, were really kind of repressed. And I think that's that's still something that, that I experience, I think most women do in some, some capacity or other, whether they're conscious of it or not. Now, the show still had a high action motion to it, but unlike a film where you have months to prepare the physical stuff, TV you're fighting every week. I mean, you know, did, were, did you and Bridget Regan have to go off and decide the, the stage your battles? And yeah, we did. We, uh, we had like a, a week, two week maximum period of time to learn basic fight moves and the base, basic choreography that would become the foundation for the fight sequences. So we learned the names of certain, uh, and names and positions of certain punches and certain kicks and, and throwing certain shapes with your body, which meant that when it came to the day of each fight, the choreographer would just have to give us our key words for what we would have it, having to do and we were able to learn it a lot quicker. Um, it took a while though, because I kind of, I've said this before, but I, when it comes to action sequences, I have a lot of confidence and no skill. So I kind of just throw myself at people in quite an aggressive way. I, I played rugby at school, so it's, it, that's just a, you run at people and, and just knock them over, kind of. So, I was like, oh, I got this, yeah, I can do that. And then the, they, the stunt guys were like, no, you just make it look like you're doing that. Don't touch me. <laughs> um, and I have, I have on my phone um, Kimberly Murphy, who is my, my amazing choreographer and stunt woman. She, she was filming me do um, the first action sequence uh, in slow motion, so that I could watch it back and critique myself and, and learn it again. And there's this slow motion video of the first time the guy in the green suit, which was my first fight in the first season, um, happened, and in rehearsals. I, act, I was meant to kick him in the leg and I kind of kicked him in this reproductive area. <laughs> um, <laughs> and what's great, what's, well, it's not great, it's a poor guy, but <laughs> what was, was kind of priceless about the whole thing is that Kimberly was filming it in slow motion, so you just see his reaction and my reaction at the same time. And he's like, <gasps> I, I, uh, I'd like to say I learned my lesson after that, but I think four or five pairs of balls got hurt <laughs> making the season one, at least. So, what percentage did you wind up doing of your own stunts, and how often did they need a stunt woman? Um, I did all my own stunts, so I did all my own fight sequences. Um, the, the only times when I wasn't allowed was things like jumping onto the car, the, the moving roof. I, I was able to kind of... Uh, jump onto it from a height when it was stationary from a certain scene, but when it actually was moving, just because, and I was like, oh, let me do it, I really, I love doing it, I love kind of throwing myself into something like that, but kind of for health and safety and insurance, it just meant if anything happens to you, we can't carry on the show, if you break your ankle, no, you can't, we can't do the show. So they were quite strict on what I could and couldn't do. Um, but, I, and, and then I had, you know, I had Kimberly, and what I did with it is I shadowed her a lot. So we worked together, we, she, we warmed up together. Um, she would come in in between takes and show me how to make a punch look more convincing, uh, convincing and certain kicks at certain angles um, looking better from where the camera was positioned. A bit more at stake in the second one? Yeah, I think um, the, the thing that I would take away from it is probably the relationship with Jarvis. Um, the, that relationship kind of deepens, and it, it. What I liked about the LA feel is like it was so bright. The clothing was brighter, and everything, and that sunshine and palm trees. But uh, there was this kind of dark underbelly of, of the crime underneath it, and and it all kind of looked quite glamorous. But there was um, there were moments of that I found very kind of emotional. I mean, I loved. I love working with James, and he's such a present actor, and he reacts and responds to everything that I do, and you feel like you're playing, you're playing with a teammate. And so when we shot that scene in the desert, where she just turns around, she gives him some home truths about who he is, he's just living in a, you know, living in this rich guy's house, and um, the, it, was, it was painful, you know, because I feel like their relationship had gotten to a point where they become, they knew each other well enough to know how to push each other's buttons. And, um, and I love that. I mean, for me, it's the, the, the best parts about any of the jobs that I've done, the, the, the relationships between the characters. And obviously, you've been very vocal in social media and at the conventions that you would love a third shot anywhere, any, any time. 
Uh, but in the meantime, though, Marvel called you back and did, um, you know, you appeared in Age of Ultron and Winter Soldier and Ant-Man and all. Um, and this is Peggy at different stages in her life. Did they give you any sort of a Peggy history to, to work from so you could inform your character? Um, yes, I, I kind of, I, I told my, I kind of told myself a few things that I felt was useful. Uh, whether or not that, that <laughs> is the case, I don't know, but I did feel that she would have come from a military background, um, given how high up she got so young, and the fact that she was a woman, it meant that I think she had definitely had a jump start with her knowledge of, of the military. And I felt that she may have, may have idolized a brother or a father uh, that she could potentially have lost early on in the First World War, which would have informed certain decisions that she made about who she was and what she wanted to do and keep that name going. Um, and I, we kind of, we, we, the, the writers were like, give me, a, give me like a suburb of England, London. I said, Hampstead. Okay, she's from Hampstead. Okay, great. And you just kind of piece it as you go along, really. And then in the second season, obviously, you, you get to meet Michael, her brother, who goes off in the war. Um, and then the third season was, is, if it we go again, um, was going to explore a little bit more of that background and maybe explore kind of life in England beforehand. And, and maybe what would be amazing since. The first one was New York, LA was the second one. I think we should go to London. Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 Actually, the scenes with, the scenes with uh, the character's brother actually were really nice. I would have liked to see more of that mm -hmm. possible. Um, any problems with the old age makeup, seeing yourself? Oh, I loved it. I really loved it. I really yeah. took my dad and the Winter Soldier, I hadn't seen it, and they had done. So I'd had prosthetics, and then they also did CGI, and then they also had another lady, um, an, an older lady. So between those three kind of things, the three layers, uh, that's how they produced the look of Peggy on her deathbed. And um, they'd also asked for me to, to give them pictures of elderly female relatives of mine, and so I gave pictures of my grandmother who had passed away. And, um, it was really nice to sit there with my dad, and he just turned to me and he went, you look like Nana. And it, was like, oh, it was really moving. Um, and, uh, and then with Ant-Man, again, it was kind of how much of it do we do with prosthetics? How, how, is it a full mask? Is it certain little pieces? Is it, can we get away with kind of what they call stippling, which is like a latex glue that you create some more wrinkles on your face and shading, um, like hollowing out the cheekbones, that sort of thing, and different kind of wigs. And so it was very much a tri trial and error for a few months until we came up with what we felt would be a good representation of Peggy at that age, based on what she did, what her lifestyle was likely to be, and also what made it not feel for the audience, that the audience would sit there going, how are they at? You know, looking for the kind of, you know, the, the wig line, like having to make it look realistic. Okay. Um, in the most recent film, the character is, you know, gets her funeral. Uh, do you think she was given a proper send-off? Yeah, well, I went to visit the set okay. of that. <laughs> In Atlanta, and uh, the day that Chris was filming my funeral, he texted me a picture of, of the photograph of Peggy that I think is by the coffin or something. Yeah. And he was like, she's, she's, You're so hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I totally would. And uh, I really was laughing about that. So I came to see it, and then I got one of the prop masters to give me a program from Peggy's funeral. And inside, so it's like, like hymns and Latin verses. Ow. and. Like she got a great send-off. Like, <laughs> she was like so proper and posh. I was very impressed. Now, following the comic book storyline, they did introduce um, the romance with uh, Sharon Carter, and I understand you've had a couple of negative comments about that. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's uh, what's the objection? Oh well, I haven't actually I haven't actually seen the film, so okay. I can't say what I you know I was like Peggy's dead. She doesn't know what's going on. I don't need to see this. This is fine. <laughs> um, but uh, no, I did. I did. It was it was kind of funny. I had this kind of running joke about it um, of uh, you know just kind of how weirdly kind of incestuous it was, and kind of yes. odd and a bit inappropriate. Um, but it was you know fair game. She's okay. going, you know, everyone's going to move on, I suppose. <laughs> I see lots of record here. Yeah. Um, what, what, what do you think of you know, the fandom you found yourself plugged into now? 
you know, going to the shows and all? What's the experience yeah. like? Well, that's been the best thing about going to conventions is when you're... I'm, I, I, what I was trained for was to be able to see an audience and feel them when you're on stage. So then to start working in front of a camera where you don't have a clue who your audience are, what they look like, what they're doing, what they're wearing, if they're coughing, if they're falling asleep in front of you, they have no idea. So to go to conventions and actually to engage with people who um, get a sense of what Peggy did or felt you know, meant for them in that moment while they were watching it is really humbling and, and kind of makes that whole experience of playing her that much more richer. Okay. Uh, I want to jump ahead a little bit to um, ABC's new series, Conviction, which is uh, debuting on October 3rd. Um, <laughs> Hayes Mars, Randy first daughter, now, you know, um, heading up a, a, a investigate, cold case investigative unit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was a drip. I got to watch the pilot, and it was a really interesting um, hour. What was the appeal to that character? Um, the showrunners called me and they said that this was a passion project of theirs and that here we have in the center of this standards, you know, in terms of a formula, it's a legal procedural, it's, it's a case a week. They said, but right in the center, the beating heart of it is this messed up, complicated, witty, um, crazy character called Hayes Morrison and she is trying so hard to keep her life together but she's a complete mess and I thought that sounds great fun <laughs> and totally different to who Peggy is. Um, and that was the appeal really and as we, we're, we're shooting episode five at the moment and um, so we're kind of, it, it, they just, it just gets more and more outrageous, the things that she does and uh, you know, she's trying, trying to keep her life together by also, and also say, solving these crimes. Just in the first episode alone, we hear so much of what she did to embarrass her, her presidential parents. Um, is she, in your mind, you know, is this new role for her trying to atone? No, the opposite. The opposite. No, she, so she's blackmailed. She's, she's uh, just to let you know the premise of it, it's, it starts off, she's in, she's in prison having been arrested for drugs possession. And, <laughs> Um, the family lawyer comes to her and says, we're going to bury you with this. We're going we're gonna to make this so much worse than it is. We're going to send you to jail. We'll ruin your career. We'll destroy your reputation. You'll never work again. Or we cover this over and you come and work for us because you are still a brilliant lawyer and you will help your mother's Senate campaign uh, if you head this crime conviction unit where you hash out all cases and, and you know, show the community that justice is being done or make, it, make everyone look good. So she really reluctantly agrees because the, the, the alternative is so bad. So she's forced into this job, which means that she arrives, she doesn't want to be there. So she's just, she's naughty, she's rebellious. And she knows that she carries all the, the weight of, the, um, of the, her, her name behind her. So she knows she can get away with a lot. And her poor team, I just don't know what to do with her. She's a complete mess. She's turning up late. She's wearing clothes from parties the night before. She's inappropriate to them. She's rude. Um, but she's also um, kind of annoyingly brilliant at what she does. Um, and, and that's kind of how, and so she finds, she figures out the pilot, okay, I'm stuck in this awful position of a job I don't want to be in. Um, it's like the lesser of two evils. But I'm going to find a way to make it work. And she actually starts to engage, engage with the stories itself. And when she gets to meet the people who are in prison and the families and how it's affected them, that's when she starts to feel like she can find her voice in this. And the, the DA is played by Eddie Cahill, and in the pilot alone, there's that little layer of one thing by. Is that something that's going to be explored? Yeah, very, 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 very much so. Um, there's, yeah, you, you, and it's in, in a surprising way, too. Um, I, I read that it's episode three and went, oh, oh, okay. And what's, I think they're doing very cleverly is they're making each episode, just when you think you know the direction it's going to go in, it suddenly, it suddenly kind of veers off to the left. I like that. It's a new show, but you're also playing in America. I mean, you're half American, your father is American. How is it mastering the, the accent? Um, it's, it's tricky because I normally, when I do an American accent, I, I, for some reason I slip into Valley Girl. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my god, really? Yeah, totally. And it's like I get really hard, like higher up in my register. 
And so, I, and I didn't think that was appropriate for a former first daughter, a strike, strike lawyer. So I thought I have to bring it down. So it was a matter of kind of getting the American accent in my own register. And um, so I worked with a brilliant voice dialect coach called Diane Piblado, and we just we felt that she'd had a privileged upbringing, which she was well educated. Therefore, her um, which we sometimes we change a certain word in the dialogue to make the pronunciation or the the choice of words and sound a little bit more kind of educated, I suppose. Um, but we've also kind of kept her sort of sense of authority by having her kind of down here, as opposed to like up here. Um, so, but it, it's been hard because I don't want to, I don't want to overdo it, and I need to do something that's sustainable for me, um, and 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 that feels kind of realistic. So it's it's quite a challenge. <laughs> It's a brand new ensemble that you're working with now because you've got the people who are working for you who you don't like, they, they, they don't know what to think about you. They all seem to have their own storylines and secrets, you know. Um, how was it bonding with, with a new cast? Well, I, from, from the pilot I made a, a big effort to make sure I wasn't in any way like Hayes Morrison. So, I hosted dinners, we do game nights. Um, we, we went to Cirque du Soleil together in Toronto. We've, what have we done? We've gone to lots of restaurants. Marin Dungy, who plays Maxine in it, who's in, in the team. She and I went to Zumba. Uh, <laughs> and she's brilliant. She won, she won like participant of the class because she was so loud. And everyone's like, you know, and the Canadians are so lovely and, and polite and cool. And then you have.